welcome. I'm Trisha. And I'm Christian. And we want to welcome you to Jesus Resurrection Life Ministries. A church where love never fails. Let us join in now with our senior pastor and founder, Pastor Dr. Mervyn Jalal, for an awesome time in the presence of the Lord as he shares, shares the word of God, God with, with us. us. Your communication, your relationship, your attitude, your, the whole, your whole physical framework is a display of what has transpired on the inside when you accepted Christ. And there is a high level of expectation from us Christians because I tell you something, a religious person may say something or do something and nobody will pick it up. But he has not anybody have anything to say. But they once they find out you are a Christian and you make a mistake, all the fingers will point at you. You're a Christian, that's what you're doing. But they'll never say you're a Hindu, that's what you do, a Muslim, that's what you do. But you are a Christian, they say, You're a Christian, that's what, what you're doing. So you have to understand there is high level of expectation. And the Lord, he, he knows that. And God has put into every man something. And they don't even realize it. It's called the image of God. And that image gravitates towards God. Because every human being worships something. But God put that image in you so you can worship Him in spirit and truth. Amen. And even the atheists, they worship something, don't even realize they worship. Okay? They're worshiping something. Because God put the desire to worship. Amen. And that desire must be, is to worship. And your focus ought to be Him. The object of worship. So, you want to make sure that you are living the life that God expects from you the moment you receive Christ into your heart because the Bible says any man in Christ is a new creation. There's a transformation that took place there. And there's a transformation, there's a change, then we ought to live that change. And that's what I want to talk about today, all right? Amen? Proverbs chapter 10 verse 9 tells us, He that walketh uprightly, that means, anyway you see the word uprightly, it means walking with integrity and moral character. It's talking about integrity and moral character. He that walketh uprightly, walketh surely. That means with confidence. But he that perverted his ways shall be known. In other words, if you pervert your ways, you are going to be discovered and punished. You shall be known. And you shall, you shall be discovered. And you'll punish. Be punished for that. In other words, it has consequences. Perversion has consequences. Upright living has great consequences. Wonderful blessings of God. So I want to talk about behaving yourself wisely today. You know, there's a saying, action speaks, action speak louder than words. All right? And your actions are what people see, right? Our behavior is an eloquent testimony. A testimony to who we are and what we think. And I want you to be at your best behavior because Jesus is coming. Holy thoughts and corrupt behavior cannot coexist cannot light and darkness cannot be in the same spot or in the same place or in the same room it's a lie to say we follow Christ if we are disregarding his word and ignoring his commands then we are living a lie this is why the Bible says, let a man examine himself and see whether he's in the faith. Because that which is not of faith is sin. All of us know how surprising and disappointing it is when you hear people give clear Christian testimonies. And yet you see that they are, have questionable lifestyles. So I want to share several things with you, several things with you today. One, the God of the Bible 
calls us to holy living. We are to make every effort to live according to his guidelines. Why? Now, there are four, at least four reasons why. First, transformation. If we are truly new creation in Christ, or new in Christ, then God's Holy Spirit is living within us, helping us, you know, want to do what is right. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 70. Secondly, see, it's not only transformation, but also visible change. Godly living is an example to unbelieving friends and families and neighbors and co-workers who may notice that we are different. We are different. People are attracted to others who are consistently kind, compassionate, gracious, and loving. That kind of attitude will attract anybody. Kindness attracts. And kindness and compassion is contagious. And thirdly, so you have transformation, visible change, and relationship. Godly living is a confirmation that we are, in fact, living for God and not for ourselves. Living for God, not relationship. It's a barometer of our relationship with him. And fourthly, following Christ. So it's transformation, visible change, relationship, and following Christ. Godly living means that we are emulating Christ, who is our ultimate example of how we live. The second thing I want you to know is this, the question really. Let me ask you this question. What does God expect of my behavior? What does God expect of my behavior? First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. He says, let no man despise your youth. You know what the word despise mean? Look down on you. Young people, God says, let no one or no man look down on you because you're young. Okay? Youth there speaks of young disciples. Look up here for a minute. Let no man despise thy youth, not necessarily has to do with age. It has to do with young disciples. And a person could be 55 years and he now, he's now, he's a convert at 55 years, he's a young disciple. Did you get that? Yeah. All right. So there's a law of double reference there. Young people and young disciples in Christ. Let no man despise you, look down on you <clears throat> because of Christ in you. But be thou an example of the believers. You're one of the believers in Christ. Be an example in word and five things it says here. In word, conversation, in charity, spirit, faith, and purity. Six things here. Hmm? Be an example in what? Say what? Word. Say it. Word. Next is what? Conversation. An example in charity. Charity means love. Next, in spirit. Next, in faith. And next in purity. You know what purity means there? Moral purity. Moral purity. From your language, your communication, your lifestyle. Moral purity. He's coming for a pure church. We have to be pure. So God wants each of us to be an example of Christ to others in these areas. Words, conversation, charity, spirit, faith, and purity. Moral purity. Be an example to all believers in what you say. In the way you live, in your love, in your faith, in your purity, be an example. And God has been speaking to us in a personal way the past few messages, you know, if you listen carefully. Paul instructs his young disciples 
his young disciples to focus on five areas where, you know, uh, molding takes place. One, he says, speech. We must guard not only our teaching, but also our words to and about each other. What we say to people, what we say about people. Because we do that every day. We say things to people, we communicate to people, and we say things about people every day. Not so? And secondly, behavior. Our, our lived out faith should cause us to acknowledge God in everything we do. Must be our faith. I live by faith. So everything I do, I do it because of my faith in God. It's a lived out faith. And that cause, that must, is a faith that causes us to um, acknowledge God in everything we do. Love is so common to us. We, we, we lost this, the, the essence of it. Like eating chicken every day, you lost the taste of chicken. You, you don't know what chicken tastes like. You know that? To me, like chicken tastes like dirt now. Everything we eat is dirt anyway. Comes from the soil, not so? But when you get accustomed to something, you lose the essence of it. You begin to take it for granted. Love. It's easier for others to follow our example if they know we love them. Faith. Because, you know, Jesus talked about, I said, men will know that you might be saved because you love one another. Amen. So faith. Others should see that our confidence in God motivates our effort in speech, in the speech, behavior, and love that we display. And then purity. Our lives should be characterized by transparency. That means what you see is what you get. In transparency, integrity, and honesty, even about our mistakes and failure. See, be honest. Be honest. That's integrity. When you're honest about your mistake and acknowledge it, and, and you know you're really, really, uh, you know, sorry, really sorry about it, and repent. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to be ashamed about. You made a mistake. You made a mistake. Find me somebody who never made a mistake. And if everybody make mistakes, then you know what? If everybody makes mistakes, then we must be forgiving and loving because you never know when you will need it. You need forgiveness. From the very people you making demands from and point your finger at and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. There are times when you are wrong too. So humble. You know, we have to humble ourselves. So don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. Let us, let us stop doing that. We have somebody to emulate, Jesus Christ. But allow God to transform you into that new person by changing the way you think. If you're having problems quarreling with someone all the time, try changing the way you think. It is always quarreling in the house, in the home, with your children, your husband, your wife, Change the way you think. Seek to understand God's will for you, which is good and pleasing, acceptable and perfect, Romans 12, 2. So relying on our own wisdom and effort will cause us to, to fall prey to the world's influence. But if we allow God's Spirit to literally transform our behavior, guess what? He will help us live by a higher standard than those who aren't yet transformed. Because what I want you to understand, we ought to be living a transformed life. Are you hearing me? Because God's will isn't always easy or convenient or pain-free. God's will is inclusive of all of that. But we must keep reminding ourselves that it is good and pleasing and perfect. 
God's will. That we may know what is the will of God, what is a good, pleasing, or acceptable and perfect will of God as we go through what God calls us to go through. Do you know something? I don't know. God calls us to suffer for Him. You ever thought of that? He calls us to suffer for Him. He says, all of you who have chosen to live for me, you will suffer persecution and will come from many different forms. What do we do when we experience it? Give up. We must remember what the Word of God says and hold on to His promise. He says, in the world you'll have tribulation, but in me you'll have peace. Be of good cheer. I have already overcome the world. So I'm leaning on the one who is the winner. And through him, I can do all things. Amen? So ask yourself frequently, how is following Jesus changing the way I think about everything? Romans 13, 13 says, let us walk honestly. As in the day, not rioting and drunkenness. Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envy. And if you look up these words in details, man, it, it includes a lot of stuff. Because we, we belong to the day, not the night. So let us walk honestly as in the day. We belong to the day, which means we can see. We have perception. We can see. We know where to put our feet. We know where to walk. It's daylight. It's bright. You walk in the night, you can stumble. But as children of the day, everything around us is revealed. We can see, we can understand, so we know, we can choose. The steps of a good man are what? Ordered by the Lord. He guides our step every day. We are not children of the night. We are children of the light. Okay? The children of the night are in darkness. They're stumbling and stumbling and stumbling until they come to the light. We must live decent lives for all to see. So if people are in darkness and you're the light, they will see the light. Amen? Uh-oh. Are you sleeping or yawning on me? We must not participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy, and bitterness, and rage, and anger. No, we are not to participate in that. We live a decent life of integrity and moral purity that everyone will see. Amen, people. God expects Christians to live by a higher standard. Amen. When somebody look at you, and look at the world, or somebody look at the office and see you working in the office and other people working in the office and you're the only Christian, they must see something shining out of you, man. Your life itself must be a message. The way you conduct yourself, behave yourself, dress yourself, everything must be emulating Christ. See? Sometimes when I communicate with people about the cashier or whoever, I see people and I, I look at the behavior, you know. I, I don't ask if they're Christian. I say, how long are you a Christian now? And the first thing I say, how do you know I'm a Christian? I say, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. And I share them what I tell them what I see. They're displaying. I did it up to this week, just a couple of days ago, right in Marble there, in Hilo, the cashier. And you, 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 you can see something different about a Christian man, no matter where you, you stand out in the crowd. You stand out wherever you are, on the job, wherever you may be, in the home, in the community, you stand out. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Right? God expects us to live at a high standard. Always reflecting His character and setting an example of good behavior for others to follow. Children, children's brain, their the, the brain is like a, a computer, you know. It's recording 
everything you say, how you do things, how you communicate in the home, children, they, they grasp that. They hold on to that. They grow up with that. It takes root in them. And then they display that in society. Whether it's good, whether it's bad. And you can see it in our nation, in the prison, in the hospital, the jail cell. You can see it everywhere. On the street, in a pool of blood. All came from how they were brought up. What was implanted in them, whether from parents or outside influence. Today, most of the influence of evil is coming through technology. Before we had any technology, we communicated more, we visited more, we talked more, we had more fun, more joy. We had no cell phone, but we had good communication. Isn't that true? I could name a lot of things. We had no disease and sickness like we have today. And we eating all kind of thing. We eating pork till the oil running down. Eating everything, anything, we eating anything. And nobody getting sick. Hospital empty. No sister don't know waiting for somebody to come in. I'm talking the truth. You go casualty, because I used to go casually, running a fall and get a cut on my foot, I go casualty for dressing and stuff. Nobody there. And the place smelling clean and nice. You no, know, you go there, you, you don't know what. You want to run out of there? Not a nice place. Beloved, all that. All, the whole world is changing today and has changed because of people's behavior. So I want you to understand today, we are no longer attempting to earn or deserve God's love. We, but we are free to please Him with our obedience. The impossibility of perfection that once haunted us now genuinely Progress is reason to celebrate. So the third thing I want you to know is this. Another question. How does my behavior affect others? How does it affect others? First Samuel chapter 20, verse 20, 34. 1 Samuel 20, 34. Remember that man called Jonathan? It says, so Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger. And did not eat, or he did eat no, no meat the second day of the month. For he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. David was his friend. And Jonathan's father did something to David that embarrassed Jonathan. And Jonathan was crushed by his father's shameful behavior towards David. The selfish the selfishness of poor behavior often hurts the people we love most. Do you know that? The story of Jonathan reminds us of the complications created by the negative ways we respond to others. Jonathan was caught between the father uh, he honored and served as king, you know, King Saul. And a friend he deeply admired who was David. And he was between. He loved both of them. But what his father did to David, his father's behavior towards David, grieved his heart to the point he didn't feel like eating. All right? The fact that David consistently honored Saul as king made it even harder for Jonathan to accept his father's treacherous behavior towards David. So it speaks volume about Jonathan. It speaks about Jonathan's compassion and love and attitude that he never betrayed either his father or his friend in spite of what took place and trans transpired between them as he navigated the enmity between both of them. Think about that. 
He navigated how to relate to David, whom he loved, his father, whom he loved, and how bad his father treated his best friend. And he navigated away. And that's what we need to do. We don't take sides and become enmity and, and create enmity between one another. We all must, we must understand both sides. Jonathan understood the side of his father. He understood his father's strength and weakness. He understood David's strength and weakness. He understood, he heard the story from both sides. So he didn't take, he, he didn't, didn't choose one side and neglect the other. He loved both of them and he tried to make amends. Try to, you know, explain to his father. Maintain his love with, his, with, with David. And sometimes we, may, we do the opposite. We hear one side of the story and we misbehave ourselves. We then hear the other side of the story and we come to our own conclusion. So we can become our, we, we, we become our own uh, judge, lawyer, judge, and jury, everything. And we make bad decisions and we create conflict and we lose friendship. And we say we are Christians and we end up in court. And the Bible tells us no Christian should put another Christian in court because we have the church and we have a pastor. And we have the Bible. This is our constitution. This, these are the rules how we behave ourselves. Not the court. We cannot, let, we cannot, cannot allow the unsaved man to make decisions for us. God already made decisions for us. See? And we sing the song, I've decided to follow Jesus. That's what it is. So, I'm reminding you this morning. Learn to navigate relationship. Watch your behavior. Watch your speech. Watch your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your loved ones. And you navigate yourself and ensure that you are not the cause for people to end up on the wrong side and even end up in hell. Because you ought to be shining, a shining light. You ought to be a peacemaker. You have to take some time, you take a slap on the right side and the left side. You go the extra mile. You do whatever it takes to exemplify Christ. Sometimes as a husband or as a wife, all you can do is just Zip and humble yourself. Amen. And know when to speak. Never talk to somebody when they're not listening. Never. A quarreling person don't hear anything. A murmuring, grumbling person ain't hearing nothing. Because their mind already made up concerning that thing. And they're trying to convince you about what they think, about what done, somebody do them this or whatever, ain't right to, you know, and they, they made up their mind, I can't, I have a conclusion already, you're the fault, don't tell me nothing. So what you're saying to defend yourself, you're wasting your time. That's what they did to Jesus. That's why he didn't even answer them until the right time came. Emulate Jesus, that's all you have to do. Not your grandfather and your grandmother or your mother-in-law. Emulate Jesus. And you'll have the peace he talked about. He says what? My peace. In me you have peace. My peace I give to you. If you do that, you don't need counseling, you know. If you come to church and listen to the word of God and apply the word of God, you need counseling, you know. I'm telling you, you don't need counseling. Because you're getting counsel every day. Right now you're getting counsel. Amen? So, he navigated the enmity between them, his father and David, and he sailed with remarkable loyalty in treacherous waters. All God is saying, Brother Ted, is that we be loyal. To God and loyal to one another. Yeah. Amen. I had a very serious meeting with my leaders on Thursday night, and I hope they all got the point I was making. 
we have, we cannot wait anymore because time is against us. We have to make changes now. So, he reassured them by speaking kindly to them both. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 18 and 21, his brothers came <clears throat> and threw themselves down before Joseph. What, look, look at something with Joseph's life. Um, Joseph had a tremendous, you know, attitude, a glorious attitude, in spite of what his brothers did to him. Okay? Jonathan had a tremendous attitude, a glorious attitude to see what Saul did to him concerning David. And these are two classic examples. We saw where Jonathan reassured his father, reassured David, and being kind to both of them. We see the same thing happen to Joseph and his brothers. In chapter 50, verse 18 to 21, and his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. You know what they did to Joseph, right? I'm talking to a church now. You know what they did to Joseph? The Bible tells us how they tried to, try to kill him. They couldn't kill him, they dumped him in a pit. He ended up, in, he ended up in, in Pharaoh's palace. He's second after Pharaoh. He's in charge now. He's the prime minister of Egypt. And he's in charge of everything now. Famine has struck his brothers and his family and everybody, living family. Now they need food. Guess where, they come? Guess where they're going to get food? They have to come to David, the very one whom they persecuted. So they came and threw themselves on before that, not knowing it was David. That was Joseph in the first time they came. They didn't know it was Joseph. And he didn't reveal himself until the second time. You know that's a revelation right there? You know there's a revelation right there? When Joseph's brothers came to him, Joseph did not reveal himself. And guess what? When they came the second time, he revealed himself. When Jesus came the first time, they didn't know what Jesus, the Jews. When he comes the second time, all Israel will know he is the Messiah. So here what happened. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I will, can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Can we get that in our spirit? He brought me to this position so I can save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid of me. I will continue to take care of you and your children. What he did? He reassured them by speaking what? How? Kindly to them. Beloved, can we do that with one another today? Can we do that with one another today? You say, well, you know, that person, that, you don't know what that person did to me in the past. That's the whole idea. When you do good to them who do bad to you, that's the whole idea. That's when they see the light shining. You see? Our behavior never happens in a vacuum or without uh, context. When others affect us, we initialize their treatment for better or worse. And then we, in turn, affect others. We see the process acted out over you know, decades, you know, in Joseph's relationship with his brothers. And we notice that the lessons he learned along the way. And sometimes whatever you go through is a learning lesson, it's a learning period. It's a season of learning. They say it's hard, it's really hard. Yes, it's hard. See? We don't know how long it took Joseph to move beyond the hurt of being betrayed by his brothers to the place where um, he could see God working in everything that happened in his life. But we can clearly see the healing results. Glory to God. We can see the healing results. So, so, so don't let your behavior be altered by your circumstance. Don't let it happen. Make up your mind according to the will of God. Take a position that God wants you to take. Stand strong, stand firm. Face the situation. Be confident in your walk with integrity and moral purity. When you do these things, you, you have a sense of peace. It matters not what happened or what comes against you. You know you're in the will of God, you're pleasing God. That's all that matters. Glory to God. 
Because the end result of your experience with God will cause others to see something emanating from you as parents, as mothers, as fathers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, in the house of the Lord, as leaders. In whatever capacity or position you are in, something good will come out of that. See? And we, we eliminate all this uh, evil speaking. See? We can clearly see the healing results in, David, in, in Joseph's life, as we are seeing in Jonathan's life. See? Where we have been the cause of pain, what do we do? Where we have been the cause of pain, what do we do? We must be willing to ask for forgiveness. What is so hard? How many know you cause pain? No, everybody calls pain to you. You don't cause pain to nobody, you know? Yeah? And, and people think that? I don't cause no problem in the house. I'm not the one wrong. We don't think wrong. We don't cause pain. Everybody doing me something. That's how we think. We're wrong. We cause pain. You cause pain. You're sitting there like an angel, but you cause pain. Somebody's life. If you can't find nobody you're causing pain to, you may be looking at one. I say you may be looking at one. But you cause pain. You may not know. That's why you ought to search yourself and check how you relate to people and see what, who. <laughs> oh boy. I thank God I'm not a judge or a lawyer. Hmm? Be willing to ask for forgiveness where others have hurt you. We must be ready to forgive and willing to see ways God could be, bring good out of the painful situation. Look what happened to, to Joseph. So listen to what Jesus said in John 13, verse 34 and 35. He said, I am giving you a new commandment. Wow. I'm giving you a new commandment. What is that commandment? Love each other. Love? Pastor, there's some people I just can't love. Jesus said, love each other. Love each other. Amen. Just as I have loved you. You think you were nice? You think you were nice so that I came and I saved you? We were dirty, wretched sinners. Dead in trespasses and sin. We rejected God. Turned our backs on God. Living in sin. Yet, His love came to us. He said, love each other as I have loved you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. No, no, no. I just love them temporary. Everlasting love. You should love each other as I have loved you. You love, your love for one another, he says, will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's how simple it is. So Jesus told his disciples that the way they treated one another would be a powerful proof that they were his followers. Huh? Every Christian marriage should be an example to the rest of the unsafe family, relatives and so. They hear you having problems. You think they want to come to the church you're going to? Or they want the Jesus you have? No. No. I think, I believe, I trust God to be the best husband in the world. I believe I am the best husband in the world. She's still discovering something about me. She's discovering some things about me. She's just taking too long. So he told his eyes, man, you could be proof. Listen, and it will be, when you do that, you know, it, it will demonstrate that following Jesus really does change lives. You know, we, we, we never know just how many people we, people are watching us, you know. You know, as we seek to live for Christ. People are watching us. Right? Amen? Right, Sister Brazil? People are watching us. They love how you miss about you living. Amen. 
He has got roti anytime he wanted. We had to put it in about a year and a half in advance. Fourthly, why is godly behavior so important? Well, whether we realize it or not, you know, others will be affected by our behavior as we follow Jesus. As you follow Jesus, people are going to be affected. In Matthew 5, verse 14, 15 and 16, it says, You are the light of the world. You heard this many times. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. That means you don't light a candle and cover it with a bowl. Hmm? But on a candlestick. Why? Because it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may what? See your good works and glorify who? Your Father which is in heaven. So remember that we don't let our light shine so that people will be impressed and praise us, but to glorify God. So that people will be influenced to what? Praise God for the transformation that took place. Hallelujah. Hmm? When people see that God can, what God can do in us, guess what? They might begin to consider what He could do in them. That's why Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 tells us, get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness. Rage, anger, harsh words. Are we hearing this? I'm asking, are we hearing this? Get rid of it and pull it off. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other. Amen. Amen. In this kind of message, you want to be sitting by your wife, you know, and your husband, or a family member, and use your elbow ministry. See? Get rid of all bitterness. Ooh. Rage. Mm, get rid of that. Anger. Get rid of that girl. Harsh words, oh, you, and they're going like this, and you see them, you want, you're talk, you, you want to know if they're dancing. Be kind to one another. Oh, that's me. Babe. Be tenderhearted. Oh. Forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Amen. We do it to one another. Amen. Go home and change your house now. You're changing curtain every year. Change your life now. Christmas come, you're changing cooking. New, New Year come, you're changing cooking. Uh, uh, Easter, you're changing cooking. And you're changing your life. You're scrubbing everything and you're scrubbing your heart. Clean up everything and you clean up your mind. Huh? He said, you see, much of the Christian life is replacement work. Say replacement work. When God Say, get rid of something. He gives you something to replace it. Amen. Remove it of this. Love, tenderness, all of these things. So you put off and you what? Put on. It's all about eliminating negative behavior or behaviors. It's all about eliminating. We do so by replacing them with ones that match God's character. Attitudes and conduct and behavior that match God's character. All, almost all of the negative and positive traits mentioned in these verses are related, are relational, not private. Relational. You express them one to another. See? We are, we, we, we are called to take seriously both what God tells us not to do and what he instructs us to do. Paul concludes this through um, the remaining, by reminding us, he says, that the way to forgive others or not reveals how well we truly understand God's forgiveness. So when we think we cannot forgive others, we should remind ourselves how much God has forgiven us. And when we say, I forgive you, but I could never forget what you did to me. I forget, I never forget what you did to me. You must remember what God. What about God say, I forgive you, I'll never forget what I've done, what you have done to me. If God do that for us, what will we do? See, so as he has forgiven us and choose not to remember for, and to forget it, we must do the same. Don't bring it up. Don't bring up the past. Don't bring it up. That's why you see when 
I'm counseling people and I understand their past and they understand that I know the past. I said, we're not going, we're not going there. We don't need to go back and dig that up. Let's move forward. Let's go forward. Don't dig up the hurt. Don't dwell on that. Forgetting those things which are behind, we press forward. Can I get an amen from somebody? So we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. And we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. When people see godly behavior in us, guess what? They will want to know what makes us different than them. They'll want to know. And we will then have the wonderful, glorious opportunity to tell them, as Titus puts it this way, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared unto all men, teaching us, teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, with a sound mind that is, and righteously uprightness with integrity and moral purity, and godly in this present world. We have to, beloved. If we claim to be God's children, we should behave like who? God's children. Our lifestyle clearly display our loyalties. Tell somebody right now, say, your lifestyle display loyalties. You know, you know, people of God will live as God commands. That's it. People of God will live as God commands. You're a child of God, you're a child of God, you're a child of God, I'm a child of God. We live the way God commands us. It will be so beautiful. A brethren can dwell together in harmony and love and understanding. Amen. Amen. Man, we will conquer this world faster than we are doing right now. Amen. First Peter chapter 3. See, when we live hopeful lives in the world, filled with despair and hopelessness, we will be noticed. Romans 8, 15 tells us, for you have not received the spirit of bondage to, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Okay? So we can live hopeful lives today. People will notice that. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 15, But sanctify the Lord thy God in your hearts, and be ready, to, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for, of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You share the love of God, share your knowledge, share the truth with humility. Not pride, humility. With meekness and fear. And you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. See? You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. We may, be even, we, we may even be confronted. And if someone asks about your hope, what you do as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But in either case, whether we are con confronted or whether we want to know the truth, you know, in either case, we must be prepared to point to Jesus and what he has done for us. See, good behavior is obligatory. Good behavior is obligatory if you are a Christian. You have an obligation as a Christian. Faith by itself isn't enough. See, you know, you know, I'm going to say it again. Faith by itself is enough. I'm almost done. Listen to me carefully. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Although our good behavior can't save us, our behavior proves whether our faith is genuine. And if our sinful behavior doesn't change because of our faith, it is, it is our, the question is, our, is our confession of faith really genuine? Think about it. Hope you listen to what I'm saying. I'm speaking the truth to you. Practical things. If our confession of faith is not changing our lives. Can we say we have genuine faith? Hmm? Or sinful behavior? Listen, we, we cannot have sinful behavior and call ourselves Christian. It, it just does, it cannot blend. It cannot blend. We are different. We are different. Amen? We are different. 
Have we asked God to forgive our sins? Have you asked God to forgive your sins? Have we asked God to forgive our sins, enter our lives, and transform us from the inside out? See, faith without good deeds is powerless. It has no hands, no feet to get anything done. And good deeds without faith is like hands and feet with no brain. No brain to give their work any ultimate purpose. That's it. Together, God's truth and our consecrated hands and feet are a dynamic combination. Let us learn to do well. Let us learn to do well. That combination will come, I mean, they can surely change the world for Jesus Christ. See, church, attitude is a big thing, you know. Let me close with a couple examples here. Attitude is a big thing. Listen to this. The great golfer, story of a great golfer and a lying woman. You heard a story before? All right. Robert Di Vincenzo, a famous Argentine golfer, once won a tournament. So he received his check, smile for the photographers, and guess what? Then he walked away into the park, parking lot and was going to his car, and a young woman approached him. And she congratulated him, you know, for winning the game and, you know, all that transpired. And then told him that, you know, um, I'm so happy you win the game. I'm so happy you, 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 you know, you won the prize and did very well. And then she started telling him, say, I have, I have no children. I have a, no, sorry, I have a child. And was child is very, very ill, almost near to death. And she said she had lost her job <clears throat> and could not pay the hospital expenses and the doctor's bill. <clears throat> and her story touched the Vincenzo. And he took out a pen and he took out a check and he endorsed the check and he gave it to her. And he said, I hope this can make the baby's day better or the baby's days better. And he gave her the check. That same day, as he was having dinner in the country club, the, the golf association's vice president sat down at his table and said, Robert, I heard that you were approached by a young woman at the parking lot. And the golfer nodded his head and said, yep. Well, said the vice president, he said, I have news for you. She lied. She has no children. She deceived you. She took your money, my friend. And the vent Vincenzo says, you mean there is no dying child? Nope, there is no dying child. There is no, there is no dying child, said the man. Well, that is the biggest and best news I've heard all week, Vincenzo says. That's the best news I've heard all week. Ladies and gentlemen, what's the moral than that? That's the true story. What's the moral than that? That's right thinking attitude. See, the vice president was concerned about the amount of money he gives to the woman. This man was concerned about the child's life. And when he heard that the child, there was no child and no child to die, that gave him joy. He didn't care about the money. That's the attitude he must have. Not a selfish attitude. Not gimme, gimme, gimme is mine. But what you can do to touch the lives of others. What you can do to you know, send a message. You know, you do that to somebody, they will live with that in their conscience. That woman will have to live with that in her conscience until she leaves this world. You see? The right thinking, that's how you win the, the war. That's how you win your battle over those who you know, try to use you and abuse you. Now, here is the great promise of God. Here is the great promise of God. And listen to this carefully. To be blessed depends on who you hear, what you hear. And it depends on hearing and doing. 
in Luke chapter 11, look, look at this. The, the blessed are those who hear and do. Watch this. In Luke eleven twenty seven, 27, as Jesus was speaking, a woman in the crowd called out and said, God bless your mother, the womb from which you came and the breast that nursed you. He heard that voice in the crowd. Eh? <clears throat> are you following me? Jesus heard that voice in the crowd. Do you know what was Jesus' reply to that? He, Jesus said, Yea, rather, but even more blessed are all those who hear the word of God and put it to practice. You see? That's the great promise of God. If you hear the word of God and put it into practice, God says you'll be blessed. And that blessing is all blessings he's talking about. So Jesus did not deny that his mother, his mother um, was blessed. But what, what happened? He focused attention on the real source of blessing. Hearing and doing what God says. You see? From the time of Jesus', Jesus conception, Mary was an outstanding model of both listening and responding to God's expressed will for her life. You remember that? She heard and she, she, she did exactly what she was told. Be it unto me according to thy word. And she was blessed. And this Jesus responded to that person who shouted and said, Blessed is your mother and the womb that give birth to you. He said, yeah, but if you want to be blessed, hear and do the instructions that God has given you. That's how you can be blessed. Okay? Look at this negative attitude. A negative attitude. A new store selling idiots. Brand new store selling idiots. Two men were taking a break in their soon-to-be new store. The store was not ready. They were still working on it. Only a few shelves were set up and so on, you know. And, uh, you know, didn't take any inventory stock or whatever. And as they were both sitting there taking a little rest on the floor, one of the guys said to his partner, he said, I bet any minute now some idiot tourist is going to walk by, put his face to the window and ask, what are we selling? No sooner were those words out of his mouth when a man walked up to the window, had a peek and asked, Hey, what do you guys uh, sell? The store. The store window looks interesting. And one of the men smiled to the other and replied sarcastically, See, we are selling idiots. Without skipping a beat. So we are selling idiots. And the man nodded and said, You are doing very well, I see. Only two idiots left. <laughs> Attitude. Perception. Thinking. How you think. When you think you're going to deceive other people, you're deceiving yourself. That's the whole idea. But look at a positive attitude. A positive attitude. Thomas Edison. You heard about Thomas Edison. Yeah? Thomas Edison's laboratory. Listen. On, in December of 1914, a big fire completely destroyed Thomas Edison's laboratory. And much of Edison's life's work went up in flames that night. And at the sight of the fire, Edison's son was frightened and so scared. He searched for his father. He found him among the smoke, calmly watching the flames all over, his face glowing as it reflected the glare of the flames. And the son was upset as he thought that his father was already uh, 67 years old and everything he had was gone up in flames, everything at the age of 67, gone into ashes. The next day, Edison looked at the burned out laboratory and said to his family, Get his family and send his family. I have good news for you. This <clears throat> disaster has a great value because all our mistakes are burned up. 
thank God we can start anew. Positive attitude. Because you know how many times you try to... Hmm? To create the light bulb. Thousands of times. And it failed. I said all of our disaster is burnt up. Thank God we can start anew. That's a positive attitude. So folks, I trust this morning that something you have heard will encapsulate your mind and bring you to the place where you check yourself in the mirror every day and see whether you are reflecting the character that emulate Christ. Because he's coming back for them that are his. Christian behavior is important. Your Christian behavior. You know, what is Christian behavior? Settle way of thinking. A settle way of thinking. How we feel about something or someone. All reflected in a person's conduct. The manner in which a person behave, or behaves, especially on a particular occasion or a given situation. There are things happening in your life right now will demand a certain type of behavior. Right now, stand on your feet and behave like a, like a true worshiper. Lift your hands and worship the Lord. Give the Lord a hand if you receive that word today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, this is, this is a serious moment right now. I, 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 I don't preach for people to feel nice. That, that's not me. I preach the word of God because we need it. We need the word of God. I teach the word of God. I preach the word of God. How many of you believe right now you have some attitude? Everybody have an attitude or attitudes. We have some behavior that needs to be changed. What we say, what we do. He sees everything that we do. He knows the thought that we think. And even though, although we step out of His will, thank God, we are never out of His care. How many of you? You'll be um, truthful and transparent enough to say, Lord, I cause hurt that I don't even know. And Lord, I have behavior that needs to change. And I am willing to put it at the feet. I don't want this to be another church service I attend and go back with the same bad behavior. Lord, I'm laying it down today. I'm laying it down today. I will behave myself wisely as David did. He said, I'll set no evil in before my eyes. I'll keep my heart pure. Created me a clean heart. Renew the right spirit within me. So if you will be truthful and genuine enough and honest enough to obey the Holy Spirit leave where you are come to this altar so be it all I need is you Lord. all I need is you
out to him. Husbands, wives, come on. You know, you know things are not way and how it's supposed to be. You know things are not. Sometimes there are disagreements, there are things that is in your is on your conscience, on your mind, bothering you. And when anger comes, you let it out. The Bible says what comes out of a man defiles him, not what goes in. Be careful what you have inside of you. It will come out. It will come out. Out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. Come on. Lay down. Lay down. Lay down on the altar right now. Jesus. Jesus. We sin with our words. We sin in so many ways, Lord. Our thoughts. We communicate badly. We behave badly. We grumble. We express bad attitude. We don't listen to correction. Even from the ones you have placed in our lives, even in the homes, in the family circle, relatives, always hearing, but not walking in obedience. We come to church and we hear the word of God and go back and remain the same way. No, 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 no. We can't let that happen. Change always takes place in the presence of God. When, when, a, when a heart is surrendered, God moves in. God will not violate your will. You have to want that change. How long are we going to struggle with the same problems over and over? When are we going to lay down, cry out to God? Jesus, you talk to God, people. You make your confession. You get things right. Take a minute and talk to God. Talk to God. Pastor Mervyn is not the answer. Jesus is. I am pointing you to Jesus. I'm pointing you to Jesus. Jesus. Precious Lord. Precious Lord. Precious Lord. Jesus. That's right. Talk to Him. Talk to Him. There's a time for everything. It's a time for everything. Jesus. Jesus. Touch your people, Lord. Touch your people, Lord. Touch your people today. Attitudes, conduct, behavior. The mind, if the mind is corrupt, if the mind is corrupt with thoughts, remember he knows every thought we think. If the mind is corrupt with thoughts, the mouth is going to speak it. The mouth is going to say what's on the mind. Let the mind of Christ be in you. the law of the spirit of life in Christ clean up your mind obedience is the only law God requires obedience is the only law God requires obedience everything falls every sin falls every sin falls under disobedience every wrong is as a result of disobedience if Adam had obeyed God, everything would have been right. All God is saying to us right now, come back. Come back to obedience. Obey your husband. Obey your wife. Obey your children. Obey your parents. Obey the Lord. Obey God's 
way of doing things. Everything must be done decently and in order. Our behavior will change when the Word of God is saturated in our lives. When our lives are permeated with the Word of God. And you know when you're living to please the Lord and doing everything you know to do right, and the enemy comes like a flood, you have the consolation, you have the courage, you have the determination, you have the willpower to overcome it. You can handle it, you can deal with it. You're never going to be struggling with fear and weaknesses. But your joy will come from the Lord because you know you're in right standing with God. You're walking in that righteous moral purity of integrity. And you're behaving yourself rightly. You'll behave yourself before your boss, your, your colleagues, your worker, your clientele, everything. You're behaving before your brothers and sisters in Christ. Leadership in every aspect. You'll behave yourself wisely. Why? Because you have the wisdom of God on your mind. Your mind is loaded with the wisdom of God. And you know how to speak to one another, how to communicate, how to behave, and to walk respectfully, and to respect one another, to understand both sides of the story, to understand David's side and King Saul's side, and you navigate yourself. Understand Joseph's brother and Joseph, and you navigate. All there for our learning. We are without excuse today. Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, and all his accusers, and yet he was able to navigate himself through it all. Through it all, we can trust the Lord today. We can trust the Lord today. Lift your hands, people, and surrender. Now, all I can ask you to do is surrender to the Lord and ask God to give you the wisdom you need to conduct yourself in a manner that's pleasing to Him. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, and Lord, you see every person standing right here in your presence right now. There are needs, there are needs in our lives, oh God. Needs for transformation, needs for change, oh God. Sometimes we think we are right and there is no wrong. Sometimes we think we are perfect and we have no flaw. And we blame everybody. We point fingers at other people and we say things. But Lord, we never look at ourselves really and say, Lord, the problem is not other people. The problem is, is me, is how I choose to respond to them is how I've been handling the situation, is how I navigate my life. That's the problem, that's the problem. It's not your wife, it's not your husband, it's how you handling yourself. It's how you navigating your life with your parents and your parents with your children. It's how you handling situation with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's how you dealing with that situation on the job. It's how you dealing with your financial situation. It's how you managing things. This problem is not with people and things. The problem is with you. You have to make that adjustment in your life. God has given us to have all the resources we need to make the adjustment necessary to please Him. And when your ways please the Lord, even the enemy and the devil and demons and everybody that come against you shall be at peace with you because it cannot overcome light. Darkness cannot overcome light. Walk in light. Walk in light. That means walk in the revelation and the knowledge of the truth and the truth will make you free every time every time and i decree that wisdom to you i release that wisdom to you i release that anointing to you right now that breaks and destroy every yoke in the mighty name of jesus in the mighty name of jesus praise god you love your brother, you love your sister, you love that person next to you. Put your arms around them and just pray, pray with them right now. Pray for a breakthrough right now. Pray one for another that you may be healed. That you may be healed mentally, spiritually, physically, bodily. You'll be healed. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. 
give us that renewal today. Give us that renewal right now, Lord. Renew that brother, renew that sister, renew, renew our thinking, oh God, renew our thinking, oh God. Renew it, oh God. Help us to treat one another with love and respect and to be caring, to be compassionate. Oh God, help us to embrace one another with love and with harmony to demonstrate that love, to demonstrate how much we care, how much we are concerned about each other's well-being. To respect one another to walk in righteousness Lord thank you Jesus hallelujah oh glory be to Jesus for, for thou O Lord are a shield about me you're my glory and the lifter of my head so simple it is so simple to love it is so simple to love but it's so difficult to be simple it is so difficult for people to be simple two months to live two weeks to live then we're going to get things right no get it right now get it right now and he touched me oh he touched 
like flame of fire his feet like fine brass burned in the furnace his voice like the sound of many waters glory to God he fell down at, his, at the feet of the one he saw Words are like thunder. He had in his hands seven stars. He looked and he saw the Lord in all his glory, shining like a raiment, and the sun has a bright, bright, full glory. And on his knees, at the feet of Jesus, on his knees, he said, he felt the hand of God. He laid his hands upon his head and said, fear not. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of hell and death. Ladies and gentlemen, when God touches you, when God touches you, your life, guarantee to change never be the same again he will touch you oh he will touch you and all his joy will flood your soul Something will happen thank you for touching everyone today transforming your way of thinking 
changing their lives and the way they pattern their lives, Lord, that they will now emulate Jesus and live and be examples to the believers. I pray, God, that your blessings will be upon your people, Lord. As they hear your word and do it, you will bless them as Jesus promised. Oh God, the one who said, Blessed are you, the womb that produces you. Even so, God, let us hear today the words that came out of the mouth of Jesus. He that hear it and do it, the instructions of the Father will be blessed. I decree your blessings upon every obedient child today. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen and Amen and Amen. The Lord bless you real good. Go back and live a changed life. Starting now. Amen? Amen? Greet somebody as you go. Come on, greet somebody as you go. Say, let's live a changed life. Let's live a changed life. Let's live a changed life. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And we hope that this powerful message was a blessing to you. You can WhatsApp your prayer request to 314-4308 or to 1-868-463-1232. You can follow us on social media to stay up to date with all the amazing things our ministry is doing to reach the loss and demonstrate His love to all. Please join us for our next service on Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. and Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. See, See you, you next time. time. God, God bless, bless you. you.